information is given. For example, if some uh, metadata has already been encoded in the same structure, the provenance engine can parse it and make interpretations of it and automatically execute it in order to reproduce the result. So by the support of this engine, we hope that we can ensure the science uh, replicability. And the bottom layer is the library layer, which has a lot of the software packages to support spatial analysis. For example, PyCell, Giada, and SPREG. We hope that we can build a cross uh, walk between these different software packages such that the result generated from one package can be automatically validated uh, by another package through the definition of the prominence model. Now I will give a demonstration of the two of the prototype and the two systems that we have been developing um, at ASU. So the goal is to ensure the interoperability between the two systems. One is implemented as a web processing service, which is compliant with the OGC standard. And the other one is a REST API. Both of them are built on PyCell, which provide the web interface to uh, enable the remote invocation of the backend functions within PyCell. Um, so the goal is to use the spatial analytical metadata stem generated from one system, S1, within S2, and to reproduce the result in S2 to cross-compare the, um, the accuracy of the result. And uh, here is a demo showing the prominence metadata for generating a local statistics using LISA. And the left-hand side, um, you can see this is the same structure which defines the input analysis type parameters and output. And in terms of input, we need the spatial weights, which gives the spatial dependency between different spatial units. And we also have an attribute, which tells us, based on which value, we want to compute the local statistics. As uh, Serge has already demoed, that the trick is we are not providing the actual weights file. Instead, we are telling the system to um, generate or reproduce the waste term on the fly. So that is the work of the prominence engine. And here is uh, just a, a, a quick demo. It's, we, this is a get request and send the execute request to the OGC WPS by providing the prominence information uh, in the link. And this sample response is encoded into the XML-based format. So implementing it as a, a OGC web processing service has the advantage that um, it can be made interoperable with other systems. And the bottom li link, you can see all the statistical results generated by the local MRSI. Uh, for example, it shows which spatial unit has the value which is statistically significant. And uh, here is um, a quick demo, and uh, this demo is implemented by our graduate students, uh, Jay Laura, so I will give the full credit to him. And uh, what we are trying to do is we are going to load the data within Columbus, Ohio. This is a crime data, so darker color show there are more crime events in the sub-areas. So what we try to do is we invoke the REST API to generate the local statistics. So now the, you can see the result has four uh, different color groups. That means the four uh, spatial patterns that is generated, for example, high values is adjacent to high values, low values is adjacent to low values, and uh, two low-high combination. And uh, what other thing we did is we used the prominence information generated from the system S1, which is a web processing service, and load into this uh, REST API to reproduce it, the data again. So we can see the data exactly the same between the two systems, S1 and S2. As for next steps. Uh, just to wrap up, since we're out of closing out of time here. Um, there's some challenges here. The technical ones are arguably the easier ones. Uh, I think getting community consensus on what the SAM specification should be is a really thorny problem given the heterogene heterogeneous nature of spatial analytical methods. Um, we've got advice from well-known members of the community that said just go and write it yourself uh, because if you go first people will follow. Um, so that's an interesting discussion perhaps that the reception people can talk about. And then more broadly, what actually, how far do you go with this? Um, we, I think geospatial analysis is particularly uh, daunting if you think about when do you stop tracking the provenance and wh where do you start in terms of someone working at their desktop doing spatial econometrics? Where does their provenance begin 
and end? And how do we deal with those issues? Thanks. Quick question for Serge and Winwin. -win. We are not engaged in repeat the, that so the, the question is uh, whether we are aware of um, a number of the prominent activities within EarthCube, the NSF program, and also um, which NCSA. Oh, the NCSA. National Data Service. Oh. Um, we, um, we are not involved in the EarthCube activity so far, but we are uh, fully aware of the existing provenance models, for example, the W3C models and also the ISO models, the, which is um, designed for the recording the provenance of um, raster data, mostly the remote sensing images. And I think this is uh, one of the earliest work that we focus on uh, capturing the provenance for spatial analysis modules. Um, if there will be some collaborations to branch um, our effort, I think that will be, that will be great. Thank you. Uh, let's have a round of applause for all of our speakers. <laughs> and let me encourage you to attend the demonstrations in the reception later. And we will now uh, adjourn this session and move to a panel discussion, I think. Well, this is going to be a very exciting panel. <laughs> <laughs> At least I can see. Uh, I do have uh, a few slides, but uh, in the interest of time, I think uh, I'm an Apple versus PC, so I'll probably go to um, cut the cheese very quickly without projecting the slides. We have a distinguished group of uh, panelists. This uh, panel is about CyberGS beyond software integration. You've seen throughout the day technical talks, 10,000 meter levels of bird's views, all included. And uh, this panel is really going to help us address how we're going to move forward. What are the challenges and opportunities going forward? And uh, I've shared with the, the panelists a set of questions I'll read to you after a short introduction to the panelists. Uh, and all of them, I think, are very well known to our communities. Uh, for uh, the sake of uh, time, uh, we have to catch up with, uh, I'll do a very quick introduction. Mark Higgin from University of Auckland, and he's been around in the US um, for quite a while uh, before going to South. Serge Ray, just to present it, Arizona State University. Dawn Wright, you saw her on the stage quite a while this morning and early afternoon. And uh, Main Yuan uh, now has a new affiliation, University of uh, Texas and uh, Dallas. I'm OK to use that? Good. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, as, as I said, these are 
distinguished scholars, uh, they've uh, been around for a good amount of time and uh, made impact. The questions we posed to them, uh, I'll just go through them very quickly, and uh, we ask them not have to respond to uh, all of them. Uh, could be any subset of the questions. Uh, the number one would be, what are the most significant challenges and opportunities remaining for future innovation and the research of CyberGS software? So still on the software subject, uh, I think to get this more uh, interactive, uh, maybe I'll hold my breath to see any of you want to tackle that question first remember the questions at all. <laughs> okay. So let me read it again. What are the most significant challenges and opportunities remaining for future innovation and research of CyberGI software? So what I saved was your opening statements uh, because of the time we, we've lost. Uh, I think I talked to you about uh, some opening remarks. Now we're getting into this interactive mode of addressing the, the questions. You could use your time for your opening remarks. Uh, my first slide. Can we put my slide? Oh, you have a slide. Yeah, yeah just we've one. got slides, man. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's only one, I promise. Hey, All these right. Chairs are funky, aren't they? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I apologize. I sensed a little bit of time pressure. Mark, yeah. yeah. All of you have slides? No, no. Yeah, no. I have, I have three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will be a quick one. Trust me. I, I, I no, no, no. It's, uh, it's much appreciated. I knew I requested late. So go ahead, Mark. You want to take the stage? Sure, or yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, so the question was, um, what are the challenges beyond software integration? And I've been inspired, I think, by listening to many of the talks today that, that, that have addressed science beyond the desktop, science uh, in a, a connected world. And, and Jack Dangerman's opening address this morning also picked up that theme from inside of ESRI. And so if we take that approach, then I think it makes it quite clear what some of the challenges are beyond software engineering. So the first question for, sorry, beyond yeah, software integration. The first challenge for us in this connected world is to find the things that are interesting for us, to discover them, and then to somehow download them or get permission to use them and learn to, to understand them, to, to understand their uh, formats and, and semantics and schema. That's our first challenge. The second challenge, if we're going to start to use these data, is to be able to harmonize them all so that they're in a consistent data model. We all know how hard that is as a challenge. Um, data integration is one of the unsolved challenges in GI science, despite the fact we've done a lot of research in this area. So this is everything from reprojecting and converting from raster to vector to harmonizing the semantics of, of, of multiple data sets that have been downloaded for mashing up. The third is to analyze. And when we're analyzing the data, it's then we might get into software-style, method-style integration problems but they come only after the data schemas have been harmonized enough for us to do analytical work on the data. And then the fourth problem, I think, is that of validation. Uh, with so much data available to us, we can mash up all kinds of things. It's even easier to make maps that are no use to anybody and are very inaccurate and probably not worth passing on to the entire community. That doesn't seem to stop them getting published regularly. <laughs> And that brings me to the final point, which is publish. Uh, this cycle of science in the new world isn't complete until that work has been placed back into a domain where other people can find it. But its value is only as great as the trail of information from steps one to four that you can pick up and associate with that particular data set, as the last presenter made quite clear. So I think those are our challenges, discover, harmonize, analyze, validate, and publish. And you can see that software integration, I think, features in the third one. But each of those is, a, I think, an unsolved problem in, in the GI science realm. Thanks very much, Opening Mark, statement. for this well-prepared uh, set of remarks. Um, 
Now let's go back to our original script, uh, since uh, <laughs> you are all much better prepared than I anticipated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was trying to get to the reception, I guess, uh, to save some lost time. All right, let's time. go. Go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I promise you this is uh, gonna go going to be very exciting. So we actually had a plan, and I think it's a wonderful plan. We'll go with the original plan. We'll keep you here for the next uh, 75 minutes also. Uh, <laughs> so let's do that. So Serge. Okay, I have slides that I, after too many presentations, I got to remember which ones these were. Uh, I have, I respond to the challenge question. Um, and I think, I still think it's software, but I think it's software broadly in terms of, as Amy talked about this morning, people sitting in the carbon life-based forms in the room and the future <laughs> ones. Um, I think a big challenge for us as a community is to engage with what's going on in open science. Uh, and by that, Typically, the first thing people think about is open source. We've heard open source used a lot here today, and that's surely important, but that's a narrow definition of open science. We have to think about open data, open collaboration, open publishing, um, and many, many other versions of open. I think we've been slow to engage with open science as a community, um, and I see that as a feature, not a bug because that's a world in flux. And sometimes it's nice to wait and see how things evolve and then get integrated when there's a little more structure. Um, and I think that there's huge opportunities there. Uh, a couple opportunities, why would we want to do this? I think ultimately it could lead to better science, not just in GI science, but uh, broadly, this notion of open science. Um, and there's some lessons we can learn from. Uh, so I'll just wing it since it's probably got all kludged up. Um, how many of you have, well, there's an image of an icon. How many of you have used GitHub? How many of you put your research code up on GitHub in a public repository? <laughs> how many of you have ever written a paper from scratch to finish on GitHub in a public repository? I did it as an experiment, and it, it fundamentally changed the way I went about writing an article because you internalize the external review process from the get-go. Um, it was painful initially, but I think at the end of uh, the process, the work was as good as I could make it personally. Uh, I got feedback from people who knew about the repository, all two of them. Um, I didn't push it and publicize it, but I think it's a really empowering effect that scales significantly that we need to think about how do we engage with that, not just for our own research projects, but, but as a community. Uh, I also edit a journal, as do many people on, on the panel, uh, and I looked at how many of our journals have requirements for putting your code and data online once it's published. And none of us require that. Some of them strongly encourage. Some of them make it voluntary. Some of them, my journal, GA, has no policy at all. And that's often a criticism of the journals, but I think the journals are not the ones that should be doing that because they don't have the infrastructure to do it, quote, right. Uh, just having a tar file up there is going to be useful to us in this room, but not to a lot of domain scientists who won't bother. So I think we need to think about cyber infrastructure to support that large-scale uh, replication and sharing of results. Do you have slides? Yeah, but... I Don't can worry maybe about come it. back to him later, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we go with Don? Sure, I'll, I'll go. I don't have any slides. Uh, I wanted, in, in fact, it's great that I'm going after Serge because the ideas that I was going to share are, uh, I think, along the same lines. I was, and, and I'm addressing the question that uh, goes beyond software also in terms of what are the challenges for the cyber GIS community. And I was thinking about the, the long term, I'll use the word sustainability or the long-term impact of cyber GIS because this has started out with an NSF project. It's now uh, mushroomed into a community. We have a series of conferences. People are making comparisons now to is cyber GIS following the same trajectory as GI science. Uh, so for instance, it started off with GI science started off with an address that Mike Goodchild gave in the early 90s and then that has mushroomed now into a whole world. So, I, so it was in that context that I was uh, thinking about where cyber GIS should be going in the future. And I was also 
uh, thinking of a recent uh, NRC workshop that Xiaowen and May and myself participated in that was run by Mike Goodchild about what is it that makes research transformative? How do we define uh, transformative research in the geographical sciences? And so I was thinking about what, how does that uh, translate to cyber GIS? What is transformative uh, about cyber GIS? And it, it could be that cyber GIS just needs to stand the test of time because one thing that is difficult with questions such as these is how do you distinguish excellent research from transformative research? When somebody is looking at your NSF proposal, if every single NSF proposal has to be transformative, if we're all supposed to be uh, vying for a Nobel Prize, well, <laughs> that's, that's rather impossible. But uh, oftentimes we, we can be transformative in terms of how our research has an impact over the test of time. So what I'm getting at here, though, is I think for cyber GIS, to get in getting beyond the software, uh, there has to be an impact uh, in the domain sciences. So this is where I think my, my thoughts are along the same line as, as Serge's in terms of open science, e-science. For the domain sciences, how are they going to be using uh, the software uh, that we develop in the cyber GIS context? What is it going to be that they can answer uh, with cyber GIS that is impossible otherwise. I think that is one of the things that we really do need to address. What is it uh, that is going to be transformational in urban planning or in atmospheric science, climate <coughs> resilience? They must have our infrastructure in order to answer questions. So I think the, the more that we can uh, articulate that uh, for domain scientists in order to uh, convince them or as we broaden our community so that domain scientists are saying themselves, without cyber GIS, without the cyber GIS gateway, I could not have come to this conclusion. I could, have not, I could not have gotten this result. So I think in order for, for that kind of uh, flowering of ideas and uh, use cases, uh, there has to be a uh, community built so as, again, as Serge was saying, the GitHub community is a very, very powerful community. Uh, Cyber GIS, this, our group uh, is a community. Uh, but I think community building is always uh, so much of a challenge. Uh, we at, at Esri, we are going through these growing pains, uh, but also, I think, reaping the benefits now of our broad cloud-based uh, ArcGIS online community because we are servicing 500,000 users per day. You know, not just 500,000 users, but 500,000 users per day. Uh, a million map requests per day. Uh, 500 terabytes of data per day. All of these uh, communities that, or subgroups, uh, that are tying into, into that platform. So uh, that's one of the, the good things uh, about cyber GIS uh, in terms of if it's the University of Illinois, if it's Shawin Center at the University of Illinois, or if it's those of us who come from all of our institutions uh, who are now part of this thing called Cyber GIS, I think we have to all uh, participate in, in building this community, in uh, reaching out to the domain sciences as, as many of us are already doing, and of course tying into these large communities that already exist such as ArcGIS Online, uh, such as Open Topography. Uh, th th there's so many of them now uh, that I think it will be uh, a very rich uh, exercise, but a lot of work in order to, to build that community. So I'll, I'll stop there. May I? I have a slide because I have three slides, so I have better stand up. So I can, oh, thank you. Very good. And well, beyond software integration, I really want to look at how Ooh. cyber GIS <laughs> have changed the way we think <laughs> and really enable us to do something that we could not have done before. Mm -hmm. And I really want to bring up the questions so we can all discuss what really enable us uh, in the cyber GIS framework. So um, one, I learned cyber stuff from Xiaowen and from colleagues when I 
took GIS classes, I never heard about cyber infrastructure. Uh, so I'm learning along the way, and one person really helped me uh, quite a bit is my colleague, Dr. Uh, Atsuchi Nara, and he is now joining uh, San Diego State University. And he is a Japanese, and he, he teach me a lot of web programming, and I realized that it's really cyber infrastructure, it real, the, the transitions of GIS is really like from sushi to pentel box to pala buffet. So how <laughs> does that work? When we eat sushi, everything is, is in one hole. So you buy an RGIS, you got an entire package. You don't get to choose which component you want and which component you do not want. So that's a de desktop GIS uh, platform or it's a desktop research. And then the pentel box is like a business analyst. Now I can choose what I want and it, or I can um, pick up the, the flavor I enjoy and put it into a box. So the platform is the tray, and I pick the components into my box. But I also think this is almost like multidisciplinary research. I contribute rice uh, in the platform, and you contribute to salad. Um, but the real exciting thing is the web services that everybody bring out their dishes in a grand way, and then we can share the dishes together, enjoy each other's contribution. Um, but the, the challenge for web services or for cyber GIS is really the consensus. You don't want one person bring Mexican, the other person bring Italian, then your stomach cannot hold, and the consequences <laughs> could be so <laughs> difficult to bear. And so for web, web services or for cyber G GIS, it's really important that the community have a consensus to understand what are the standards and what are the things that we can compatible and interoperable. And the, the second thing is that when we talk about cyber, and there are a lot of things out there, the big data, big computation, and I just joined University of Texas in Dallas, and we know that everything is bigger in Dallas, uh, in Texas. So I can appreciate the importance of being big. But to be big is more important than to from a very messy piles of big data and big computation to see something big and useful from it. And just like a, a, a pile of Legos, uh, how can we work together and to see the importance of how they interoperable together and build something beyond a pile of uh, the the Legos as it individually and not integrated, but is compatible and interoperable. So my key thing is that I, I think uh, whether the, the system is integrated or not, to me, may not be as important in a cyber uh, or web service community, but interoperable might be more important to make pieces, make data interoperable with each other, make, make tools interoperable in, with each other. And then we, as a community, we develop the infrastructure, the standards, so that I can contribute something interoperable for your, your tools or your data, and everybody can contribute to have a big pile buffet. And I think that uh, the cyber, cyber framework allows us to create a world or a technology that we can know everything about anywhere at any time. And to me, that's the vision. And, and really, I, I should really tie that to my very last point. Uh, that is actually from Star Wars. Uh, may the force <laughs> be with you. But for us, and may, the ge may geography be with you at all time. So we carry out the knowledge of everything about everywhere at any time so that we can make decisions and, and, and then adjust our behaviors or adjust our uh, 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 thinking about the world and understand the world. And so they, let's go back to the third point, the big data and build computation. And what, what can we do to really create new knowledge and discover new knowledge that is not possible to be known without the cyber infrastructure? And for me, it's really to, we create a cyber commons for geographical knowledge sharing, contextualization, and production. In, in other words, that cyber GIS allow us to think about 
geographical knowledge production in very different ways. Rather than individually produce a sushi and then put the sushi together, we actually ma mash up all our knowledge into a grand pala buffet. And, and, and then I also, you know, the, the second to the last point is my personal uh, biases. I think that currently a lot of G, uh, cyber GIS or GIS infrastructure, uh, uh, web GIS mapping, very much focus on geographical features, not much emphasize on geographical events. And I think the cyber infrastructure or cyber GIS should really look into how can we put geographical events in, in a common framework so that we can know what are the precursors for certain event to occur? What are the consequences of event? Uh, my favorite example is uh, El Nino, to know that the processes of upwellings in the South America will change the uh, ocean current situations in the Pacific, and then that ocean current change will change the temperature uh, gradients, and then consequently will have drought or other events occur uh, in, in the uh, climate. So how, how can we follow similar uh, thinking to look at different geographical events, the, how they uh, occur in space and time, how can they, they develop in space and time, so that we can create the geographical knowledge of how the event propagate, how the event trigger each other, how the event developed in the common framework. And I also think that currently, uh, our concept of time in GIS is really much focused on chronology, chronological time, clock time. And with the common cyber commons for geographical information, then we can really focus on chirological time. Chiral times are time of opportunity. opportunity. So uh, I think that for me, the best example is if I, if I eat lunch at 12 o'clock, and I follow the chronological time. But if I eat lunch when I'm hungry, then I follow the chiral time. So we need to look at the geographic uh, world and see what are the chiral times, different events and processes follow, so we can understand the geographical processes and geographical world even better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, many thanks for sharing all of this uh, very interesting and illuminating thoughts. Um, I have a few follow-up questions, but maybe I should ask panelists first to respond to each other's comments. I want to respond to Don's because it triggered that I had it on the slide that didn't show up. The sense of the importance of building community. I mean, having in the open source world, having good code is not enough. You need engaged users, engaged developers. We need engaged scientists. And that is not easy to do. Um, just trying to get, uh, I've been active in Scientific Python for a long time now, and just trying to get them to think about geospatial things has been, I started in 2001. This year was the first year they had a domain in geospatial things. And it was dominated by petroleum geologists, but okay, it's a start. Um, but I think it's really important because I think this community has a huge amount to, to contribute there, but getting the door open is, is really important and I'm sure other folks would have the same experiences of trying to break through, um, disseminate what this community is producing and have it be utilized and maybe contributed to by people from other areas and it's, it's very hard. I don't have any good solutions. Mark? Yeah, I'd like to comment on that too. Uh, I think, uh, Dawn, you're absolutely right that cyber infrastructure is a, is a two-sided coin. On the one hand, you want fantastic discoveries and great progress, but on the other hand, you, you are creating an infrastructure for a community of researchers. And my question, I think at the first cyber GIS meeting at the AAG many years ago now, was what's in this for the 7,000 other geographers who aren't in this session? Mm -hmm. The 7,000 other AAG members, what do they want from a cyber infrastructure? And I think a asking that question would, would produce some very interesting answers, which might not necessarily straight away lead to um, huge funding uh, opportunities or even huge scientific breakthroughs, 
But what it would do over time is have a huge positive effect on the discipline. And I think it would get 7,000 other people telling NSF that this is a good idea and they should fund it. Uh, along those lines, I wanted to uh, respond to May's comment, but what Mark has just said uh, about the community, I think, is, is really important. It, it strikes me also that what is burgeoning right now with cyber GIS is in parallel with what is burgeoning in terms of geodesign, hence our conference, which is covering both of those themes. And I think what May uh, said also is very important in terms of getting away from just thinking about time chronologically and thinking about the, co the consequences, the consequences of, of actions, uh, the consequences of doing something at a particular time, uh, the Cairo time, uh, in, in terms of just the, the clock time. And to me, that is the message of geodesign because the whole process of geodesign, as, we, as we've seen in presentations today, and particularly with the geoplanner, is that you lay out a scenario and then there are consequences to that scenario. So you're going to have to think about changing your actions, doing something at a different time, uh, adding new data, taking a different approach. So I think we're, we're hopefully getting a little closer to that. Uh, and, and also uh, the idea of uh, being able to respond immediately. So it's not just the disaster situation, but uh, certainly if we see that we're going down uh, a road that is our ideas are not going to bear fruit, then we need to be able to uh, take a different tack, try a different algorithm, uh, look for better data and so forth. And I also want to respond to what Sergio say about uh, putting the, you said you start working on paper in Giha, mm -hmm. and, and then people start giving you feedback and then help you through the process. And I, I think I really like that idea of, because right now we, we finish our research, we write a paper, submit to a journal, and for some years, I finally realized that the journal editor's responsibility is really helping the author to revise the manuscript and then eventually get published. But I think to move that process even further early as the starting writing the manuscript, and I, I think that that will really shorten the review period. And so once you submit the paper, you probably will get very good review and then we can publish very quickly. So the turnaround times will not be 45 days, hopefully within a week. <laughs> Cairo time. Yes, Cairo time. <laughs> yeah, and there's some other developments in this regard. People are putting, um, in bioinformatics, I've seen a couple instances of people putting their proposals that got rejected at NSF up as examples for people to see, well, what went wrong with this? They don't put the reviews up, but they said, this is my proposal. I put it in, this was my proposal got accepted or funded. And a sharing sense that to me is a new world in, in that maybe science becomes a little more collaborative as opposed to competitive. Um, it, I think people are starting to jump. It was who's gonna do this first because uh, there's opportunity costs and um, we do have institutions that are slow to evolve. There are still major pressures for people to publish. Uh, so you get the paper out the door, you don't go back and clean up the code that produced your cool result because you gotta write the next paper. So that code is far from production code. It's far from code that you're gonna send to somebody else who's gonna be able to reproduce your results. And science suffers because of that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some private costs that we have to think about. There's institutional costs we have to think about, but other disciplines are starting to do it. And I think, mm -hmm. um, it's scary initially. If, I remember the first time I released something as open source code. I was terrified. I said, these people are going to laugh. They probably did laugh <laughs> at the quality of the code, but I got over that really quick because pretty soon people were contributing, improving the code, and I learned a lot more in that process than I would have if I kept it in my little silo. And writing's the same way. Writing's painful. It's hard. Um, but getting feedback from your colleagues, even people who are critical, can be very beneficial. And Nancy, I think, was the only one who raised her hand when I asked if anyone's ever done that. <laughs> what was your experience? Well, Dan hasn't organized this, so he can talk to the oh, okay. tomorrow.
Dan will be here Thursday, so we can have a conversation with him for the entire day. Um, so I was thinking, going through the commonality among your comments, so one element is about community building. So the CyberGS project was designed to be founded on the community building process, and Tim's is still here, I think. Um, chair is empty, so I take his role. Um, and over the years, we've made progress in this regard, and uh, for instance, partnership with ASRI and uh, USGS and Oak Ridge National Lab, that was also meant to be open up to extend to related communities, uh, for, for instance, uh, hydrology, and now we're developing collaborative even capabilities with HydroShare. And we've learned lessons and, um, and also some things we've done right uh, along the way. So I was curious, as you were commenting on each other, what you would share with us going forward, how do we further the community building process and activities? Uh, based on what you have learned. And you commented on AAG, and I think our AAG workshops are growing. Um, at least the number indicated became more popular, but, uh, but we still do not have a, a reasonable clue as yeah. to you know, what is the assessment coming from the community on an average basis. So I guess this is because we're talking about it going forward, right? Uh, community building, I think it is crucial. Uh, a direct response to Don's comment, it clearly is not an Illinois Shaolin's thing. This is becoming a community thing, and it's designed to be a community thing. Um, and it's reflecting the nature of, uh, of this term and what it entails. Yes? I think one useful strategy for, to achieve that, which many of the other cyber infrastructures have adopted, is that you identify some key stakeholders who are involved in different areas of geographical analysis. You make sure none of them are actually funded by this project. And you go to them and you take their problems and you show them that you can actually provide a solution to them that's better than the one they have. And you'll make 10 advocates who have um, <laughs> reputation and influence over the domain who you aren't already funding. That will broaden the church quite a lot. That's what's actually impressed me very much. I'm, I'm going to use the, the University of Illinois as an example, though, because I think mm -hmm. uh, given the, the partners that you have uh, engaged now, uh, Xiaowen, uh, for instance, with uh, the biofuels uh, discussion that we had this morning and then seeing that play out in the cyber GIS gateway, to me, that's a very nice example of perhaps going to a stakeholder in a different area, such as what Mark is uh, uh, advocating for. You go to somebody in a, a department. Uh, for instance, when I was at Oregon State, I was surprised at how uh, I was getting drawn into the sociology department and to uh, health and human services. These are colleagues that I had never uh, spoken to uh, before, but because there was uh, a need uh, in terms of spatial data and GIS, and if I were still there, I would be advocating the, the cyber GIS. You, you uh, sell your wares, so to speak, to them, I, I think is what uh, Mark is talking about. So I, again, uh, kudos to the University of Illinois uh, for what you're building there, and we're seeing this at other campuses as well. Arizona State, I think, is another ex uh, fantastic example. And then at UCSB, there's the spatial at UCSB, which I think is, uh, that's part of what, what they're trying to do as well. So we're doing this with, with GIS, the traditional GIS, but it, it's certainly something that, that we can uh, think about in terms of the cyber GIS now. Mm -hmm. And then at different conferences. So for instance, uh, ESRI is going to have its biggest presence at the American Geophysical Union meeting in December. And there will be a lot, it won't be called cyber GIS, but there will be a lot of, uh, I think, parallel or like uh, discussions. And uh, so we're going to be involved, uh, I think, in 11 uh, paper sessions. Uh, and, and our, I mean, we are so cyber GIS oriented now that we are essentially bringing the message of cyber GIS uh, as we go to meetings like that. And for those of you who aren't familiar with these other communities like the American Geophysical Union or the Ecological Society of America is another big one. 
but AGU will have about 20, upwards of 20,000. So uh, for us, it's, it's quite amazing because there is another conference that dwarfs our user conference. <laughs> you know, we are not the biggest game in town <laughs> where that's concerned. But I think that technology-wise, the, the web is already very well accepted. Um, a lot of government agencies, um, when they want to do something with GIS, they always ask for a web applications. And the mobile GIS and cloud GIS are very much in line with the cyber GIS, except that they don't have the supercomputing, high-performance computing elements. Um, but I think that what is lacking is really the education and that we do not have a very, what do I say, consensus of what we should teach uh, to incorporate cyber GIS or web uh, applications into our GIS colloquium. And we, we do not have a clear idea about the, the sequence of lectures that we need to make sure that students understand different topical area to have develop different competencies. For the first class of Cyber GIS fellows, could you raise your hands? Mm -hmm. All right. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> so they will be solving this problem for us, correct? <laughs> we're not going to, we're going to have a curriculum, a Cyber GIS curriculum. That's, that's the, that's a key aim. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a one year process. I tweeted uh, the announcement of the 17 fellows awarded. We see this serving two uh, critical aims. One is what May just mentioned as, I think both opportunity and challenge. The other one is community building because um, these fellows will be preaching to their campuses based on what they proposed as uh, their very compelling ideas. And, uh, and also diversity, as I was mentioning this morning in my talk, the domains they represent, uh, but also the kinds of institutions that they represent. I think we should open up the floor, not just talking to ourselves uh, on the stage, um, I also have some additional questions not all of the panelists responded to. Uh, so it's your time, your reflections on what has happened today, which I hope is useful for you to share your ideas based upon the things you've um, got exposed to, but also respond or follow up to what you have learned from the panelists I thought are really uh, interesting set of ideas. So floor is completely open. Yes, Wendy. I have a question to Mark. Uh, for the five thousand you listed on your slide, yep. you had to rent them in terms of urgency for geospatial domains rather than general cyber infrastructure needs. Which one would you think is the most urgent issue mm -hmm. that's facing? Could you repeat the question, Mark? Yeah, the question is, of the five different elements I put up on my list, which one is the most critical to GI science? And I run the risk of, of upsetting many of my colleagues by giving an answer. But I, I honestly think the integration problem, the data integration problem, is the hardest problem of, that, of those five. Uh, and I think we're, we're far from having a general solution for that. Uh, I, th I think the, the software integration problem is also pretty hard, and the discovery problem relies on having the semantics. So num problem number three relies on problem number one. But uh, yeah, I think, I think the semantics and the complexities of our various domains and how they might interoperate is the biggest challenge. So let me follow up to that. I think this is a, a question I included in the original list of questions to you. What challenges among the five, or maybe some newer ones you did not uh, describe explicitly, are 
the best opportunities the CyberGS community is positioned to address and tackle. Sounds I like a good one to open up to the audience. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So your thoughts. Yes, sorry, David. So the comment from David was, what is the unique aspect of CyberGS in contrast or in the context of uh, cyber infrastructure? And what are the ways to communicate that effectively uh, in the broad science enterprise? Responses from the panelists. Mark, well, this Mark almost, Go ahead. I think this might not be too much different from how GIS different from IS and it's the spatial components and how we use space mm -hmm. as the tool for analysis and organize or to organize information um, but this is I think this is very superficial maybe there might have some deeper meanings that I, I haven't gotten it so maybe other people will have contributions Don first, and then um, Carol, and then there's another hand up, Budu. Okay, let's go with that order. Uh, order. Well, I wanted to try and answer the question. Are you guys going to try and answer the question too? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, David, I think they're 90% the same, but I think the 10% that's different is really, really different. Um, I think there are two areas that strike me as being potentially the most different and the most problematic. The first is in the spatial and spatio-temporal nature of the domain and the complexities of the different kinds of data that we try to integrate in those domains. So our domain decomposition and our data decomposition from a scientific computing and HPC point of view are really challenging, more challenging than they are for global circulation models, for example. The second area where I think we are different is that we acknowledge as a discipline, perhaps more than most other sciences, that our data are very situated and very socially constructed. And so understanding our data involves understanding the social construction and the meaning behind the data, which is very much a product of how it was created and by whom and for what. This is true for all the sciences, but as a group of scientists, the geographers understand that better than anyone else. So I think we have a real contribution to make here in terms of putting into the cyber infrastructure what the data actually means to the community who made it and the community who use it. And I think this is a, 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 a not very well understood area if you look at all the other cyber infrastructures that, that exist so far. So two things. Um, yeah, maybe more than one. Um, I'll make up if I don't remember what I was thinking <laughs> in the initial. So, you know, I I'll point out one observation, which is we haven't had a cyber GIS infrastructure meeting where we had hardware vendor people present. So essentially, we are, in a way, promoting the notion that other people have built 
computers for their purpose, and we are trying to come and see how far we can stretch those, which I think we need to get out of, and because our class of problems, which you know, we have been discussing this, Shawin and I, back and forth, this whole paradigm of geocomputation is data-driven. You go and look at the big computers that sit on at Oak Ridge and NCSA, they are designed to solve a class of problems that are very unlike ours. We start with a large volume of data and nobody's building it. The second observation is, if you think about GIS, you know, which scientific community comes closest to our kinds of data and analysis? There is one, they are producing the simplest of data that you can think about when you are thinking GIS, which is raster, right? A whole goblets of raster being produced and they are trying to store it, analyze it, serve it, visualize it, and this is the large climate community, right? You go to any of their meetings or any of their websites and you try to find the word cyber GIS or even GIS. I got thrown out of a meeting because <laughs> I said climate is nothing but a very simple GIS and they banned me from participating in future telecons. But I, I think I'm, uh, I'll, I'll get back to that meeting eventually. But, but that's that mentality, right? So they don't, they don't. You know, that would be our success when we are being able to see cyber GIS appear on DOE's program or NOAA's program or EPA's program on climate. It doesn't ha happen today, right? So that should be a very s clear target for our community to get to that level of realization that what is our um, true impact, right? What, wh why, what, is the, what is it different in our world that we can bring to these people that nobody else can? Thanks, Budu. Any quick reactions to those points made by Budu? I, I think it's also a matter of semantics because uh, I would argue that cyber GIS is actually being conducted at uh, NOAA and some of these other agencies, but they don't call it cyber GIS. And I think that our... Uh, That's exactly the point. Yes. And, and so we, uh, we need some time to, uh, to educate or to have them uh, have these communities see what we see in terms of, you know, this is a spatial problem it's something, it's a spatial cyber infrastructure problem. It's a spatial uh, analysis problem. It's very difficult, I think, in these other, these other communities and these other domains to sometimes make the links in terms of how we are using language. Uh, and I think once we can get past that barrier, then as you say, we'll, we'll see cyber GIS show up in some of these, uh, some of these meetings or in these abstracts. Uh, it, it was uh, a hard sell for Xiaowen and I to actually get a paper uh, accepted by the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on spatial cyber infrastructure. Uh, they did not know what that was. They did not know why it was important. And uh, it was, I, I think, a, a labor of, of love to, to get that message through. And it, it, it takes uh, repeated, concerted efforts in the spirit of community building, I would like to know what that meeting was that you were thrown out of so that we can do a little bit of mission work there. Maybe we can talk about that offline. Yeah. Um, I agree with a lot of the comments and discussions. Um, I'm going to um, comment on maybe from a different perspective. One comment is that um, it seems like a lot of the applications that were presented today, uh, it seemed to involve uh, really deep collaborations uh, between the cyber GIS team and the domain scientists. So my question is, is there something that um, can be done to, to uh, make it a little bit more easier for, for domain scientists? Uh, the second comment is really what I see the difference between cyber GIS and just um, um, cyber infrastructure for other types of high performance computing applications. It's really the, the, the way that you would have to understand the geospatial data and incorporate that, integrate that into your thinking when you approach problems. 
So it may not necessarily be uh, manifested in terms of hardware or, or computer architecture or even software. Um, it really should begin at the very beginning when you approach the problem. And that's something really hard to do for, some, for people who are not uh, within this community. So um, I'd like to hear uh, reactions or comments from the panelists. Um, by the way, Carol Song from Purdue University, computer cyber infrastructure scientists. Yeah, I think uh, th it touches on education, how we train and mentor the next generation of scholars. Uh, there's an excellent model out there called software carpentry. Anyone ever participate in software carpentry? Um, and they're currently expanding the curriculum to have, they basically teach basic computational literacy uh, to domain scientists. So what's a terminal, what's an editor, how to use GitHub, basic stuff that their, their uh, ethos is most science is done by the blind leading the blind in that the, prof <laughs> the old gray beard professors, I don't want to be sexist, but that's their language, um, <laughs> learn the stuff how to use editors and they expect their students to learn it le like it's passed down from the heavens. They don't teach it in classes. So software carpentry has taken on themselves to do boot camps basically voluntarily across, it started in Toronto, I think, across the US. Uh, so I think it could be a cool project for some of our new fellows to contribute to that or to craft a module on cyber infrastructure boot camp, something like that, yeah. that domain scientists want to get engaged with the cyber infrastructure. It, it lowers that learning curve so where they can start to exploit these technologies. I think that's a critical uh, need there. I wanted to follow up on that. Um, I, I, you, you raise a really good point. I think one of the things that strikes me though is um, we don't want to, if we're trying to build community, we can't wait for the next generation to become the current generation. And so there's a lot of us current generation people who are, you know, you, you raise the issue of using GitHub for publications. And I, I mean, I took that down. I'm going to take that back and try and encourage people to explore that because, you know, there's this resistance level about new software learning that you, you reach your comfort level with a suite of applications and you try and keep current with those if you're lucky. Um, I guess one of the things that strikes me is, is in, in following on, on some of the other discussions is the need to encourage people to rethink the problems because if you're not a developer, you're coming at the problems with the can, the toolboxes that you can, that you have access to, whether it's ESRI or others. And so it's, it's um, when you go to domain scientists and say, hey, let's build some application, I think that's a really good idea, but then there's this other world of domain scientists who aren't really seeing their problem as scalable. And a lot of our problems we approach as non-scalable solutions. And how do we turn around with some of these new methods and say, hey, we could actually take this small aerial problem and expand its computational demand and really deal with the uncertainty in a bunch of different ways that we haven't even approached because we haven't had the tools. And that might be a really exciting way, you know, to go about co community building within the current domain of scientists. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I think there's, a, there's an idea from architecture called pattern languages. And it's becoming quite popular in both software engineering but I, uh, and, and other disciplines too, like bioinformatics. The idea is you find a pattern, uh, which is a set of activities that, you, that do something useful at, uh, at a level of abstraction that's low enough so that it's actually helpful to other people. Like how do you design a room with good light or what's a chair for? Things like that. And, and you describe that small thing rather than trying to solve too many problems all at once. Mm -hmm. And then you publish that pattern and you encourage other people to use it. Now in bioinformatics, people have started to publish patterns of how they do various genomics processes in wet labs, how they do things on the bench. And I think there's a real opportunity for us to try and cash in on some of those ideas. So that we, we publish things that are useful to other researchers, things that, 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 that they might want to look for in a how-to book, how to do GIS, you know, two-minute recipes for the hundred most popular pieces of functionality or uh, processes that you have to get done. Yeah, and I think your point is a good one about the time criticality of training, not waiting for the next generation. And the way software carpentry is successful is that they don't tell you, we're going to teach you GitHub, 
what a terminal is, how to write shell scripts. We're going to teach you how to be more productive in your science, and that gets people's attention. It's, and then they teach them GitHub. Yeah. And, <laughs> but they get the buy-in up front because the, the person sees what the benefit is. Yeah. Just to plug, if, if, you, if you haven't heard of software carpentry before, I put my students through it uh, earlier in the year, my graduate students, and it's helped them immensely yeah. uh, just to become better, more productive, uh, more able to share their code. So I really heartily recommend that. You can get someone to come on site and train your people up uh, in a, in a one-day workshop. It's a really useful thing to do. Uh, contact the folks at Mozilla who run Software Carpentry now. Maybe I, we should have I, a workshop on that or... You should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I'm really enjoying uh, this panel session. So there's been a lot of discussion about expanding to other domain sciences, and there's been several which have gone unmentioned today, and I think I know why, because it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, so s specifically, health GIS, security for GIS, intelligence for GIS. They're all within silos for very good reasons, right? So what can we do and how can we begin expanding the tool set, um, which is working very well in very specific domains right now, to all these other domains which may have very tight restrictions? Private clouds, possibly? Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um. I'm thinking and talking at the same time because what your question reminded me another discussion I have with ESI Press, and they want to publish some eBooks for GIS eBooks, and I, my thinking is that electronics books is really good, but the current form of publication seems not taking the advantage of the electronics format. What I'm thinking is that electronic books should should be uh, built around modules. So different uh, 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 repository of modules. And then people with different expertise to see how different tools can be applied for different domain applications and then incorporate that in the modules when they teach the course. So suppose we want to teach buffer in, in the class. So there is a module about how to, uh, how the buffers algorithm is to create and how, what is the the, the basic routine of using the buffer operation. And then students in, uh, from biology or students from public health, students from social sciences and, sciences, and they will think about how the buffers will apply to their, their field. And then when they made that connection of how the buffer can use in their domain uh, science, and they will take it away to, to Used in a way that we cannot anticipate it, but that, that knowledge have to bring it back to the repository so that other people can see how different tools use in different domain domain applications. So the repository is really should be starting with some basic uh, tools and methods, and then grow upon with student contribution and faculty contributions to how. Addition, the additional tools and how those tools can apply to different fields. Right, but that would be bringing the domain scientist into CyberGIS, right? But how can we actually take the tools of CyberGIS and make them accessible to data custodians who will not let their data out of the building over their dead mm -hmm. body? Yeah. I think the first thing you've got to be able to show them is that, that you've got a solution to a problem that they have. And for example, in health GIS, one problem that might be interesting to explore would be modeling individuals in an infectious disease network over a national or even a global scale. And if you could model or simulate that uh, using a supercomputer, I'm sure that would be of, of great interest. So I think you have to be proactive. If you want to bring someone like a climate scientist or a, or a health informaticist into this community, you have to have something that they need. And I think we do. It, it may be a little a little easier for for us at Esri to uh, engage uh, like the intelligence community, the defense community, because we are working on cybersecurity problems right now, and we have specific uh, collaborations uh, with those uh, with those communities. But that's that's where again the the broader community uh, is very important because 
you know, at Esri, we, we have those ties into the intelligence community, but we also have the tie into the academic community, into this community, and there, there are all kinds of collaborative projects that we can uh, think of and just email each other and start working on some things together. So I think that's, that's another way. You, you just start talking to people. Uh, again, using my Oregon State example, I, I had to actually leave my building and go to another <laughs> building and go into somebody else's office that I had never been to before and just start talking about uh, problems and as Mark says, mm -hmm. bringing a solution to them that uh, helps them solve their problem. So I think um, being a domain scientist, I'm not even sure I'm understanding everything you're saying, but um, <laughs> I think there is a uh, very interesting opportunity in the middle here where access to very interesting data is a challenge and then creating the new crop of individuals uh, needs to be enabled. Now, uh, let, me, let me give it an attempt. Uh, one type of data out there that we really have limited access to is really in food and agriculture. Um, I think you have, many of you may have heard, actually a few people have grabbed me in the, uh, auditor outside the auditorium uh, regarding Monsanto and, and Climate Corp and, and, uh, and their new efforts towards studying the big data behind food and agriculture and, and increasing productivity. Uh, these are proprietary efforts. And I think Monsanto thinks they're sitting on top of a potential gold mine. Uh, so getting access to that data, although it's been discussed and we have been in some of those discussions with them, uh, really feels like they're picking at our ideas uh, more like uh, seagulls or something, uh, as opposed to uh, a really uh, uh, seeking to collaborate. Okay, so uh, that, that is one major issue, ma a very major issue. But now that being said, I tend to believe that since this data is so tightly held proprietarily, it feeds backwards towards the students that we're creating. It actually has influenced us away from some of these computational sciences in our educational practices, particularly at the undergrad level. Uh, 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 the collaboration we've had recently with uh, Xiaowen has really always been at this very high level, working with postdocs uh, and above. So now, that's not sustainable, <laughs> however. It is not sustainable uh, in the long run. What I would be seeking and what we are searching for very actively right now is what are that subset of courses you add to in our case, an engineering curriculum, which is already packed with a whole host of other uh, physical science courses and biological science courses in order to make ag and bioengineers. And that's, that's a really limited set. I probably have five or six courses to work with. And that's, I'm guessing, not quite enough. So uh, if there are ways, and I have to believe right now, many, many of those are probably going to be project-based type of courses that end up getting people involved, accessing the hubs, creating codes, sharing them and distributing them, and then sharing the data, of course. Uh, creating that uh, uh, good practice, if you will, from, from the uh, uh, lower levels. I think that's where you're really going to see some So I'd, I'd love to hear some comment, but that's, those are the thoughts from our side. One way that's been achieved, again, in some of the other cyber infrastructure projects funded by the NSF is to run a summer school. So if you run a summer school, it doesn't interfere with curricula and you can send your students along. And during a one-week intensive program, they get to try out all of these various methods and, again, become a little bit skilled. And obviously, you, you invite educators to come to the program too and to teach from that cross-disciplinary perspective. I know that's worked really well for some of the older uh, infrastructures in this country in terms of getting the graduate students who might be able to use this technology actually up to speed with it. And it solves the problem that if you do this one-on-one, -on -one, responding to requests over uh, email, um, you can never scale it up. But if you do it once a year, if a team does it once a year, it's scalable. So Wendy has a question over here. Uh, Show Wendy. How are we doing with the time, Steve? Oh, <laughs> It's time for beer. <laughs> Come yeah. on. We can continue the conversation. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, in the, in the break. Wow. Thanks. I'm really enjoying the panel. Uh, one question. I think that the community building and the education um, issues combined is that it seems 
it's already, ev everybody agrees it's uh, um, important to reach out to the beneficiaries of cyber GIS and, and it, tell them that we can help them. That, that's great. But do you feel that the cyber GI scientists, well, people in this room and your students, have enough um, software, the, the, the IT side of, this, of the skills, the, the, the software development side of the knowledge to really carry this cyber GIS forward completely without reaching out to computer scientists, the hard, hardcore computer scientists. And if, if that's necessary or beneficial, how to do that? I think that's probably a bigger challenge than reaching out to the domain scientists and saying, we can help you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, I couldn't agree with that more. Just to respond to that quickly, uh, is particularly with geography students, uh, I think there's still uh, a, a fear of coding and of uh, software development. Uh, I, just, just from my own experience in talking to a, a variety of geography students on different campuses, not, not just my, my own former campus. And so I think that there needs to be a culture change there where uh, we get students really comfortable with, with coding. Uh, I think for a, for a lot of my students, it started with just making a web page. It's HTML, it's not the real thing, but it's, it's a beginning. And they're coding something and, f and seeing the results immediately when they, when they bring up their, the web page that they've created, and then they go on from there. But I think you've touched on a really important issue, uh, a, a really hard problem. Yeah, I, I agree with what Don says, but and I think the culture is changing. As Mark pointed out, we are, as geography, it used to drive me crazy because I was in departments that had really strong critical components and it was sometimes painful yeah. to be in those discussions. <laughs> yeah. But we've survived to the point where now you have people doing critical social theory but also doing analytic work mm -hmm. using these tools. And that's, I never thought that would happen, to be yeah. honest. So I think that's going to mean that in geography, people don't see spatial analysis as something you use to do research, but perhaps something you do research on and mm -hmm. help make it more comprehensive. So the old model would be go to CS and steal good students and, and bring them back. But I don't think we have to steal anymore. They come more and more. Once yeah. they know about programs like Shawens, that's very attractive to, to good students. Um, so we can grow our own, but we could also have immigration policies that help us. Yeah, agreed. I think, um, just to, to finish, for me at least, the, the, um, the role of the hardcore computer scientists, we're always going to need that. Oops, <laughs> my microphone just dropped off. That must be a sign, right? <laughs> <laughs> but to make, here we go. Um, that's right. <laughs> I didn't know they could do that from up there, but apparently they can. <laughs> we're always going to need those people, and um, we're always going to need the, the hardcore geographers too, but, but it's important we have people who are in the middle. And to do that, we need our students to know some XML, we need them to know how databases work, and we need them to be able to do a bit of programming. And it's not as hard as it used to be to do programming. Python's great. You can do almost everything you need to do, including hardcore MPI, message passing interface, programming, and high performance computing, you can do from Python now. And it's not hard to learn to program in Python. So I think it's time to go back to our geographer departments and say, can we rethink this now? Mm -hmm. It's not hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, but I think that since the GIS software packages become easier and easier to use, um, the irony is student would say that, I want to use GIS, why do I need to bother about developing tools in GIS? So uh, I, I think that we ha students have different tastes and different preferences. We just have to nourish people, students that they are another side of the GIS is exciting and creating new things. And hopefully some people, some students will bite and then you know, they become that group of students that are really into developing tools. I think on that note, cyber GIS represents a transformation at least based on my personal opinion. That means there are both requirements for creating new tools and new capabilities, and that also get translated into innovation opportunities. So in order to empower our students to be able to benefit from those opportunities and contributing to the transformation, 
this is a different time than what we got used to maybe mm -hmm. you know, five or eight years ago, which was the trend that tools are become easier and easier and the mainstream technology wasn't changing that much. All right, any final words? <laughs> well, let's thank our panelists one more time again. This has been so interesting, and thank you all very much for your participation and patience.